whether it's Zacchaeus hiding up in a tree or a nameless woman trying to touch the hem of his garment or somebody in this room who thinks God is not watching them. Oh, he's watching. We can't hide in the multitude. Well, if you will open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 6. We are in verses 53 through 56, the end of the chapter. We've been in Mark chapter 6 for a little while, and we've looked at sometimes just one or two verses. And today we're going to look at three, well, I guess four actually. And this almost seems like a, uh, I don't know, maybe an inconsequential little bit of information. And you think, well, why is... Why is that so important that we have to stop and spend an entire morning worship service on these four verses that seem to be just carrying the story from one place to another? Well, I think that it's in that that we find some really excellent, excellent principles of life, things that we need to know and ways that we can see how the Lord is working in the lives of people because He's consistent. He works in our lives in the same way. Even though 2,000 plus years have passed, the Lord is still at work in the lives of people. And I think we'll see that as we make our way through here. I want to begin by reading the passage and starting at verse 53. It says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through the whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as were touched, as many as touched him, were made well. Father, give us wisdom, your wisdom, as we look into your word. This is your authoritative, inspired, inerrant word. There are the words of life, and Father, we pray that we might not pass over them lightly, but that we might see here those lessons that you have for us today. Father, help us to stay focused on you, to have hearts and minds that are open to what your Spirit would say to your church, to each of us individually. And we pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So this little scenario here follows the day before. And the day before was filled with teaching, it was filled with the feeding of a multitude of people, probably Fifteen to 20,000 people altogether, 5,000 men plus all the women and children. That was the day before. The night before this event was not a very restful night for any of them. Jesus spent the night in prayer up on a, an elevation, a small mountain there after he had sent the crowds away. He got away for some time with his heavenly father and, and just fellowshiped in prayer, and we talked a little bit about that last time. Meanwhile, his disciples were out there on the Sea of Galilee, the lake of Gennesaret. They were rowing like mad because they were in the midst of a violent windstorm, and the waves and stuff were blowing around them, and the wind was contrary to their progress. And they got stuck in about uh, sometime between 3 and 6 a.m., the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking to them on the water. And of course, they were at first terrified, and then Jesus cried out and said, Don't be afraid, it's, it's I, literally, it's I am. And Jesus enabled Peter to walk to him on the water, but Peter got his eyes off the Lord and started to get his feet wet and cried out, short prayer, Lord save me, and he did. And they got back into the boat, and suddenly... They were there at the land where they were going. There near the city or the town of Gennesaret. So Jesus performed quite a number of miracles that night. and He hadn't been sleeping. He'd been praying. The disciples hadn't been sleeping. They would, had been rowing. 
And so they get to the shore and they're getting off the boat and just as people are beginning to wake up and they see that Jesus is there and some of the crowds that had been with Jesus the day before, maybe they're starting to arrive a little bit later in the morning, word is beginning to circulate. Hey, Jesus is in the area. And what happens? Well, they start to bring people. The sick, the lame, those that had all kinds of problems, and it just never stops. You know, that's true about ministry. It just never stops. You need to, uh, you need to spend time with the Lord in prayer. You need to spend time sometimes on a mountain just getting your battery refreshed. If you've ever worked with people, you know that that's true. People are sometimes exhausting. If you, and it doesn't really matter whether it's what the profession might be. If you're working with people constantly, we, we wear one another out, don't we? <laughs> That's just the way it is. It's because we are needy people. We need help. We need one another. We need all kinds of things. And while sometimes we can help one another and encourage one another, it's when we bring those needs to Jesus that we have those needs met and met completely and met thoroughly so that we can go home refreshed. And that's what's some of what's happening here. Let's think about these crowds for a minute. You know, almost wherever you see Jesus, you see a crowd, don't you? He doesn't get a lot of time alone. He has to work at it to be able to be alone. Early in his ministry, I'm just going to read these verses. You don't necessarily need to turn to them, but just to refresh them in our minds. Early in his ministry, Jesus was very attractive to the multitudes. And even here, now in, in the time frame, we're entering that last year of Jesus' public ministry. And, and if we kind of draw a little picture of it, here is where his public ministry begins and people start finding out about him and, and his popularity just sort of grows as time goes by. Now, along with that is a little undercurrent of opposition from the religious leaders. But when we get to that point where we're about one year from the crucifixion, Jesus' ministry changes. More and more, he is seeking to withdraw. More and more, he is teaching not straight, direct sermons, but he's teaching in parables. More and more, the opposition is growing in its, its visibility and in its strength of opposition. And the popularity which Jesus experienced begins to decline right about this point in the story right about at the three year three and a half uh, at the two and a half year mark Jesus there are four Passovers mentioned the fourth one is where Jesus is crucified his ministry begins about six months before the first one that's mentioned so we're, we're moving along here and we're about a year from his crucifixion and that's where things really begin to change. And his popularity decreases and the opposition increases. But in the beginning, lots of popularity. Listen to Matthew 4.25. Great multitudes followed him. From Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan, that's a wide area, folks. Jesus is popular. His word is spreading. Mark chapter 3, which we looked at some months ago, it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond Jordan, and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. So now, not only do we have, if we put it on a map here, here's Jerusalem, up here is Capernaum on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. Over here are all these Iturea and Decapolis and beyond the Jordan, east of the Jordan. Up here is Tyre and Sidon. So, I mean, he's drawing people from all over, from the south, from the north, from the east, from the west. People are coming to see Jesus. 
And Jesus had compassion on the people. That's something else that you see repeated in the scriptures. For example, in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, not too long ago, it says, Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. Moved with compassion. Because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. He's moved with compassion. And as he sees the multitude, he likens them to sheep, which are not really bright animals, you know? I mean, they're just not the brightest bulbs in the animal box. They can't take care of themselves. They can get lost standing in front of the place that they need to go. I mean, they're, they're just not the brightest animals on the planet. And Jesus looks at the massed crowds of humanity and he sees them like sheep. They're weak, they're vulnerable, they're not able to provide for themselves, they can't figure out which direction to go, they're in a great deal of trouble and probably will die unless they have a shepherd. The shepherd is the one who protects the sheep. The shepherd is the one who provides for the sheep. The shepherd is the one who defends the sheep against the enemy. The shepherd is the one who takes care of the flock. With a good shepherd, a flock will thrive. They will produce lots of wool because they are healthy animals. They will produce lots of baby sheep because they are healthy animals. And because they are producing baby sheep, the flock will grow. And because the flock grows, the owner of the flock will prosper. The shepherd is the key to all of that. And Jesus saw the people, not physically, that they were in trouble, though many of them were, but spiritually. Spiritually, they, they had shepherds, they had rabbis, they had priests, but they weren't teaching and preaching the Word of God. They were busy teaching the doctrines of men, the traditions of the elders. They were busy fleecing the sheep, taking from the sheep for their own interests. Now, every shepherd could shear the sheep and, and make clothing for himself. That was part of being a shepherd. And there were occasions when the shepherd was perfectly legitimate in taking one of the flock and slaughtering it for his own food. That was perfectly legitimate. The shepherd in, a, in the ancient Near East could live from the flock. That was proper. But the spiritual shepherds of Israel, they were not feeding the flock. They were not disseminating the truth of God's word. They were not caring for the sick. They didn't care whether these poor, spiritually deprived people knew God or not. They were just worried about themselves. Let's get the tithe in here so that we can benefit from that. Let's follow all the rules and regulations that we've made so that we can benefit from that. They weren't caring for the sheep. But Jesus, the true shepherd, the great shepherd, he comes and he sees not just the physical condition of the people, but he sees their spiritual condition. And he takes pity on them. He takes pity. Because that's what shepherds do. Jesus, by the way, acknowledged individuals that were hidden within the crowds. He saw the crowd. Now, when you and I see a big crowd, it's hard for us to see individuals in it, isn't it? to think about their needs. We tend to think about the big mob of people and maybe how we can 
keep from getting caught up in it or something. I don't know. But Jesus saw individuals that were otherwise hidden. In Mark chapter 5, when Jesus returns to Capernaum, there's the fellow named Jairus. He was the uh, ruler of the synagogue there. And he made himself known. He came to Jesus and sought Jesus out and said, Jesus, please come help quick. My daughter is at the brink of death. So Jesus is going with Jairus through town and making his way to the home. And here comes this woman in the crowd. She wants to be as unobtrusive as possible. She's not crying out to Jesus. She's not trying to stop Jesus. She's not approaching Jesus from the front so that he'll see her. No, she's sneaking up behind thinking, boy, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. And as soon as she did, she was healed. And as soon as she started to turn away and move back into the crowd, sort of melt back in there to nothingness, Jesus stopped, turned, and called her out. Because it wasn't just her physical healing that needed to happen. It was her emotional and social healing within the community. She'd been an outcast, a pariah. She was unclean. She wasn't welcome anywhere. And now Jesus, in the midst of that sea of people, that mob of people, Jesus identifies this woman, calls her out, brings her to himself, and gives her a blessing, and tells her to go because her faith has made her whole. In Luke chapter 19, we won't read it, but you know the little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man. Yeah, okay. So we grew up together. Um, <laughs> you, you've heard the story of Zacchaeus, right? He's a, he's a tax collector. He's, he's not very well thought of in the community. And he's a short guy. And so there he is in the crowd. He's trying to see over. He can't see. Nobody, everybody's pushing him back. They don't like him to start with, and he has no advantage of height. So he goes ahead, and he climbs up into a tree. Now, there he is in the crowd. He didn't really call attention to himself. But as the mob comes around the corner, and they're proceeding along by, and there's this sycamore tree, all of a sudden, Jesus stops. Now, Jesus didn't see him climb up into that sycamore tree. Jesus probably didn't, real, didn't see him maneuvering in the crowd. But he stops right there. And he looks up. He says, Zacchaeus. Calls him by name. They hadn't met before. We have no indication that they had. Zacchaeus. Come on down. I'm going to your house today. In that whole mob of people thronging Jesus, Jesus sees the individual. <clears throat> the people had all kinds of expectations, and this is why one of the reasons why, from the beginning, his popularity grew until uh, the expectations of the people aren't being met. And then the popularity begins to wane a little bit. Listen to John chapter 6, verse 15. We looked at it last time when we talked about the, the reaction of the crowd to this miraculous feeding of the 5,000. John says, therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Ah, the crowd is looking around for a ruler. The crowd is sick and tired of Rome and they're looking around for somebody to lead them and they see Jesus and they see what he can do and they're thinking, here is king material. Let's make him a king. Well, Jesus wasn't going to have anything with, with that. that. That wasn't his plan. That's not his purpose at this particular moment. John also, in commenting on the feeding of the multitude, says this, or Jesus actually, John records it, Jesus says this the following day, says he answered them and said, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They wanted a meal ticket. They wanted somebody to give them everything they needed. And they didn't want to have to work for it. 
just, just give us, you know. I mean, after all, Jesus didn't use tell us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So how about it? Come on. Let's have it. They were looking at Jesus as a meal ticket, and that's not the way Jesus is going to be looked at. Some were looking at him as the Messiah in John chapter 12. This is, this is future now. It's his entry into Jerusalem. It's at the fourth Passover. This event that I'm mentioning here still at the, this point in our story is about a year away. But it shows us the expectation of the crowds. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took palm branches of, or branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They're looking at him as a Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who's going to throw off the shackles of Rome and make Israel great once again, just like King Solomon. That's what they're looking for. Look at him as a Messiah. They look at him as a healer. Mark chapter 1, verse 34, it says, Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Luke chapter 4, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one and healed them. Luke chapter 6, verse 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. In other words, they saw him as a miracle worker who could heal people from disease. That's what they were seeing Jesus as. But Jesus knew the crowd. He knew their hearts. He knew that the crowd was a fickle bunch. I mean, they could be swayed with the next breeze of the wind. So in John chapter 2, this is early, this is the first Passover. It says, now when Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Ah, Jesus is doing some miracles here and he's attracting a crowd and people are saying, yeah, boy, this is what we want. Let's hook our, our wagon to his star here. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and he had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. People come to Jesus today for all kinds of reasons, don't they? Jesus is never fooled, ever. He knows why someone comes to him. He knows the reality of their coming to him, whether it's genuine or whether it's for some other motive. I can't always tell, you can't always tell, but Jesus can. John chapter six, therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force, to make him a king. In other words, he perceived it. He knew it. He knew what their, their motive was. Luke chapter 9. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. There was a lot of opinion about Jesus. But he knew what was in the crowd. He knew what their, their hearts were. John ch or Mark chapter 15. This is where the crowd turns against Jesus and demands his death. The scribes and the Pharisees and the priests are able to whisper in the ears of the crowd. This is the same crowd, by the way, that just a week before had cried, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And just a few days later, they're screaming, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Please don't ever depend on the crowd, okay? Don't ever depend on the majority. Because the majority of the time, the majority is wrong. Have you noticed that? You can always sell people a bill of goods and get a lot of people excited about something. 
but it might be false. Jesus knew what was in the hearts of people. He was never fooled, and though he had compassion on them, and though he healed many, and though he provided for them, yet Jesus knew those who were his. What about the crowds today? What about the multitudes today? Well, I was just astounded this week. I looked up world population. 8.1 billion people. That's a lot of people. 8.1 billion people. Big crowd, isn't it? It's a big world. That's the world that you and I have been commissioned to take the gospel to. How are we doing? Not very well, I'm afraid. We're having trouble getting the gospel to the people that live across the street from us, much less people that live around the world. But there's a big crowd of people. There's a, there's, there's a lot of interest in Jesus, isn't there? When you look on the news and you see that there's people that follow the latest so-called vision of some mystic somewhere that they saw Jesus or they saw Mary or something, you know, appears on the side of a building and everybody flocks to see it. It's, you scratch your head and you think, my goodness, is, is, this, is this what Christianity is about? No, it's not. Not at all. But it passes for Christianity, doesn't it? It passes for religious stuff and people are attracted to religious stuff. The whole world is religious. Even the atheist, he's got his own religion. It's the religion of self. He figures that he knows everything in the universe and therefore he can conclude with absolute assurance in his heart and mind that there is no God. I've got news for the atheist. He is a fallen finite creature and he does not know everything. And his, his ignorance of God is self-imposed. He has to work real hard because if you just simply consider your own body, walk outside and look at the world God's created, take your next breath and try to figure out how is it that these lungs are able to get oxygen out of all this stuff that we breathe in and, and keep the body functioning. It, it, it screams for a designer. It screams for a first cause. It screams for God. There's lots of evidence. And people all over the world are interested. And you know what? Jesus has compassion on the atheist, on the Hindu, on the Islamist, on everybody. You say, Pastor, are you sure about that? Absolutely sure. They're breathing, aren't they? They're still alive. They're not staying alive by their own sheer willpower. Every breath that you and I and every person of the 8.1 billion people on this planet take is a gift from God. We all eat. We all have the basic necessities of life. Some have them more than others, but God provides the basic necessities of life. He sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. There's springtime and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer. All those things are still functioning. And all the world, every human being on the face of the planet benefits from what we call God's common grace. It is his compassion extended to his creation. He could blot them all out in a moment, but he doesn't. He's long-suffering toward this world. And those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, we have been commissioned by God to be his representatives to this lost world. If you haven't read the Great Commission in Matthew 28 lately, Jesus says to the believers, while you are going, make disciples. He doesn't tell the unbelievers to come into the church building. It's not their responsibility 
to get here to hear the message. It's our responsibility, God-given responsibility, to take the message that we hear here, H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E, that we hear here and take it to the world. To take it wherever we go. And that's an expression of God's compassion on a lost world. He has sent messengers into the lost world to tell the world of their lostness and to point them to the way of salvation. You, me, we are a part of God's compassion extended to this world. And I understand why sometimes the world wonders whether or not God knows about them and loves them and cares for them. Because we haven't done our job very well. We haven't represented our Savior as we ought. We say we're his hands and feet, but the world looks at it and think that he must be crippled and lame because nothing's getting out to the world. We have his written word, the Bible. This book is available in a multitude of languages. Now, it may not be available in a particular person's dialect, in their, their heart language, but it is available to all the world in some language that they can understand. You know, for example, in, excuse me, in Africa, many of those countries had been colonized by European countries, and so French was the official language, or German the official language, or Dutch the official language, or something like that. And many people in those countries will speak those official languages. But then they also have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of dialects. Many of them are not even written down. And so while the word of God may not be available in every single language and dialect on the face of the planet, it is sufficiently available for everyone to know it. And God has left his fingerprints all over the created universe, so much so that Romans says that we are without excuse. But to have the written word of God is a precious, precious, precious gift. And it's an indication that God is concerned about people, individuals, all over the world. He has compassion on them. He's given them the truth. Well, what's the response of the multitude? How does, how does the world, how do these 8.1 billion people respond? Well, some with curiosity. And they're willing to read it, they're willing to think about it, willing to talk about it, speculate about it, who Jesus might be. They're kind of like those folks that, well, he's Elijah, maybe he's, you know, John the Baptist, risen from the dead, maybe he's one of those prophets. Well, they'll enter into religious conversation with you and be happy to share your idea, their idea, and everybody else's idea. They're curious. Some get involved in Christianity for personal gain. You know, it's popular to be thought of as being a Christian. So I'll go to this church and I'll get my name on the roll and, and, and I'll, I'll sort of, you know, be a member in name and whatever benefit that gets to me, you know, my, my boss goes to that church. So if I go to that church, maybe my boss will promote me kind of a thing. People do that. Confusion. Some folks in the world say, you know what? The Hindus have 330 million or 60 million gods, goddesses. Uh, we've got the Jews, we've got Christians, we've got the Muslims that, that you know, they all say there's one God. Um, and, and then there's all the American Indians and the Great Spirit, and there's, there's all these. De How in the world? I'm just going to throw in the towel and not pay any attention to it. 
It's too confusing to sort this religion stuff out. Yeah, there's people that respond that way. And so because they don't want to take any time to sort things out and to seek the truth, they just brush the whole thing aside. And then there's those that, like the people of old, want the benefits without the commitment. Oh, they'll pray. They'll ask God for this, that, and the other thing. And then they'll get mad at him if they don't get exactly what they want. They're just looking for the benefits. They don't want God to take the air away that they breathe, but they don't want to acknowledge who God is. They don't want God to take their health away, but they don't want to acknowledge who God is. There's all kinds of responses, and some of them, the worst one, is absolute hatred. And we see that, you know, people just absolutely hate God, and they hate God's people, and they behave accordingly. But beloved, I want you to see from these verses that Jesus knows every individual, every circumstance, every person. You can't hide in the multitude. There's no safety in numbers because Jesus knows every single individual. Whether it's Zacchaeus hiding up in a tree or a nameless woman trying to touch the hem of his garment or somebody in this room who thinks God is not watching them. Oh, he's watching. He knows your name. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. He knows everything about us. We can't hide in the multitude. Can't do it. And we can't just brush God off. Well, we can try, and maybe it seems for a while like we've been successful. But there's coming a day when we will stand individually before our Creator. And what will we do then? What will be your response then? It, it'll be too late to finally, in repentance and faith, bow the knee. If you've blown God off all through your life, and now suddenly you're standing before him and he's the judge of all men, it's too late. The crime has already been committed and now the sentence is going to be passed. You will bow your knee and you will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, but if you've not done that willingly in your lifetime, you will do it unwillingly before him and after which he will cast you forever into the lake of fire. There's going to be a mob of people in that lake of fire. Sadly. Sadly. There doesn't have to be. They would turn to the Lord in repentance. Turn to me all the ends of the earth and be saved, the Old Testament prophets say. God doesn't take any delight in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should return to him. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus demonstrated compassion on the multitude, on the lost multitudes. Only a few repented, only a few came. But the invitation was to all. The demonstration of compassion was to all. And God's still doing it the same way today. All 8.1 billion people on the face of the planet could turn to the Lord and be saved. But they won't. Beloved, I don't know where you stand today before the Lord. But if it's not in a relationship of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation... I would implore you, you can't hide from God. He knows your name. He knows where you are. Turn to him and be saved. Turn to him in repentance and receive that gift of eternal life. That's why Jesus came. That's why he lived a perfect life. That's why he sacrificed himself there on the cross of Calvary. 
to take all of the wrath of Almighty God against sin, to take it himself in our place so that we who put our trust in him can be forgiven and set free. That's the point that we're at today. What do you, as an individual, part of that 8.1 billion people on the planet, what do you do with Jesus Christ? Do you reject him? Or have you received him as your savior? If you haven't yet, you can. And it's very, very simple. Simply acknowledge to God that God, what your word says is true. I am a sinner. I am not worthy to be in your presence. Forgive me of my sin. I believe what Jesus did, he did for me. I believe his resurrection was for me. Make me your child. And he will. He will. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. A matter of taking God at his word. And your life will never be the same. Now and in eternity. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, I pray for those who might be here this morning and they don't know you as their, as their Savior yet. But Lord, your Spirit is working on their heart. And your Spirit is convincing them that what they have heard this morning is true, that the Word of God is that which reveals to us the way to eternal life. They're being convinced in their heart that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And Father, your Spirit is drawing them to yourself. I pray that they will not resist that. That they will come to you in repentance and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because you delight in having mercy. You have compassion on the lost. You provide for them, even in their lostness, that they might turn to you and be saved. Father, please, do your sovereign work in the lives of all of us here. For those of us who know you as Savior, Lord, may we take seriously that admonition to share the gospel with people around us for your glory and for their good. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.